I just want to start off, again, my little pastoral word. Um, I love what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, and this is kind of my posture towards my message today. He says this, verses 12 through 15. He says, I will always remind you, Peter says, I'll always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you've been taught. And it's only right that I should keep on reminding you. As long as I live for our Lord Jesus Christ to show me that I must soon leave this earthly life. I'm not saying that, Ramp Church, okay? So I will work hard to, look at this, make sure you always remember these things after I am gone. We, we can't, in, in the community of Jesus followers, we can't have this, um, the, this obsession with new things like the culture around us has where we're so willing to forget yesterday's thing yeah. because we just have um, an obsession with whatever's new, whatever I don't currently have. Um, hashtag FOMO, right? There's this constant drive in the world around us. It is a current um, that's constantly taking us away from what we've known into the new thing, which is why we'll stand in line for 12 hours for the new iPhone that has a 5 megapixel camera when the one that has 3.8 in our pocket just doesn't feel like enough megapixels, whatever those are. Um, there is a drive for the new thing, but there's something about being mature in God that we stay rooted in things that, that seem ancient. But we have a posture that is meditative enough that it keeps what is ancient alive and fresh in our hearts. Because the reason why it's ancient is because, um, because it wins the test of time. It stands against every cultural moment, every... Um, as Ephesians would say, every wind of doctrine, every fresh philosophy, every even individual or personal or family challenge that we have, the reason we're still telling the same stories is because they're, they're equally relevant now as they were a thousand years ago and two thousand years ago and three thousand years ago and four thousand years ago. This is not your Twitter feed. Right? This is, this, is, this is not something. Now, every new generation has the responsibility to contextualize for our cultural moment this ancient message. But let's be people who are deep enough that we can take an ancient truth and keep it relevant and alive in our heart today. Um, it's just as relevant. So the thing that's changing in that equation is not the truth, the relevancy of the truth. It's my posture towards the truth. Right? Um, which, which is why when you find someone who's young in God and these truths are fresh to them, they, it, it, their whole world is transformed by these realities. It's why you can, you can sing Amazing Grace at a tune, 20 beats per minute too slow, and they're on the front row on their knees with tears streaming down their face with hands lifted up in the air. Right? And me, I'm just like, well, if the singers would just get their act together, you know, this is not quite the right key. And if the, they would just speed it up to the right, then, then my heart would be miraculously moved and I would love God more. <laughs> What's the difference? The, 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 the truth of God's amazing grace is the same. But my posture towards that ancient truth has changed. So we have a responsibility. And this is, this is what the apostle Peter, the church leader, he's trying to tell his church I'm going to stir you up in the way of remembrance. And I love the word remember because it's even, it's, it is even a picture of us of what that looks like. It is remembering something. In other words, something has been dismembered. The reality has been dismembered. It's been separated. So it's not relevant to me anymore. And the act of remembering is taking what has been dismembered and putting those pieces back together, taking the emotional and mental space and time to remember that which life's challenges 
or the opinions of other people or my past, my hang-ups, my issues, those things that I just forget these truths that are incredibly important and transformative, it dismembers those truths. But this is why we should meditate regularly on things that are quite simple but profound, like the cross, like the resurrection, like the fact that, uh, wait a second, I remember where I was when he found me. There was absolutely nothing I could have done to say yes to him. Like I remember how messed up I was when, um, when I didn't even know how to, how, how, to, how to respond. But he found me in that place. And when I remember that, all of a sudden it becomes live in my heart again. So I'm, I, I have, hopefully I can get through all of these, but maybe not. I have six don't forgets that I'm going to tell you today. Six don't forget. And these are about posturing ourselves in the place of remembering. And these are stirring in my heart because it's obvious that God's doing something unusual in our community. And it isn't just in our community. It's it's in places all around the world. Um, I've heard different metaphors for that. I love the metaphor that Matt Gilman shared over the weekend about um, a, a boiling pot where there's, uh, when a pot starts to boil, you see just little bubbles start to pop. Uh, but eventually, um, there's a roaring boil. And there are little bubbles all over the world of God's Spirit just kind of popping up in different places. And here at Ramp Church, we're just a sliver of what God's doing in our city, in our region, in our nation. Um, there's amazing things happening all across our city. We're really serious about our little sliver. But we also recognize that God's way bigger than what he's doing here. But I am going to take it seriously. I'm going to lean into this moment. So as I started thinking this, I'm going, in light of that, what should be our posture? Here's where the pastoral element comes in. What should be our posture towards what's happening? And what do we do? What do we do as a people who are recognizing God on a regular old Friday night youth uh, meeting is deciding to invade the lives of young people and change their trajectory? change their sense of identity and their self-worth and send them back into their everyday life as missionaries. Right? Well, how do we respond to these? And so that's why I have six don't forgets. The first don't forget is this. Um, it's quite simple. Don't forget that you belong here. You have a place at the table of the Lord. And this is for some of you, maybe you, you still feel like you're on the outside looking in. Have you ever felt like that? Um, I, I feel I've felt like that before in seasons like looking for a local church. Maybe you're new to, to Ramp Church. I, 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 to me, the experience of like going to a church I'm not familiar with is like attending someone else's family reunion. You know, you're kind of like, uh, this is awkward. <laughs> this is really awkward. Like it's way beyond the awkward of like inside jokes that you don't get. Like it's way beyond that. And you're just kind of on the outside like, what's happening here? And and then someone like comes out of their little family reunion group and approaches you and you're like, I don't know if I'm happy about this or not. Like, like maybe I want to stay. So it's, it's, it's kind of an outside in kind of a posture, isn't it? Well, I want to tell you, you, you belong here. You belong in the house of the Lord. You belong at the table with your father. And sometimes the reason we have a hard time seeing that is because we think God is like, a father or an authority figure we had in the past that I don't like. We think he's like that, but he's not like that. He is a good father. And if you imagine the fatherhood of God and the automatic access that gives you to his life, just imagine you being able to step into his presence at any moment, at any moment. Regardless of the struggle, regardless of the challenge, regardless of your personal condition, imagine that type of access into the presence of, of, of our Father. I mean, just, just think if you were the father or the mother, in, in whether you have children or not, whether you'll ever have children, just imagine you were the father and mother that, that you wished you could be, an ideal father or mother. Would there ever be a time your, your, your child would approach you that you would say, uh-uh? No, no, I, I remember what you did yesterday. <laughs> Get away from me. No, that's, that's, that's never our posture towards our children as, as an ideal father or mother. Me on my best day, okay? I'm not talking about my worst day. 
I'm talking about me on my best day. That isn't my posture towards my kids. You have a place here. And the reason you have a place here is because you're not just standing in your own righteousness. You are standing in the work of what someone else has done for you. You are standing in the good stead of Jesus towards our Father. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be an offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Romans 3.22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, I love this phrase, no matter who we are. This is true of you. Um, when I was a younger man, I had a friend whose dad was a, a local judge, and he handled all like the traffic violations in our area. And um, as I'm sure you're aware, you start driving quite young in America. And now that I have my oldest is nearly 16, um, I think that is a terrible law. <laughs> um, but we, of course, loved and took advantage of that. And the fact that I had a friend whose dad was a judge that handled traffic violations, I'm not saying I ever used that relationship in a corrupt way, but some of our friends did. I would just say that. And when they had speeding or parking violations, at times that was sent to a friend. I'm not affirming or denying my involvement in that process. But I will say many of those people in their adulthood have grieved the corruption of the justice system. <laughs> but what would happen is that said ticket would be sent to friend who would then send it up the flagpole to the, to the judge father who would then somehow miraculously handle the parking or the speeding ticket. This is what Jesus has done for you and for me. <laughs> it was our violation, but because of his relationship with the Father, the violation is completely wiped from your record. <clears throat> this is the righteousness that we stand in. And every time we approach the Father, he is not recounting our list of wrongs. Because we are covered by our connection with his son. Um, my friend's dad never looked at the name on the ticket, right? He just knew this is my son's friend. And if my son wants me to handle this, I'll handle this. Are you with me? Just forget the whole illegal corruption of justice thing there if you can. I know it's a stretch, friends. I know it's a stretch. Don't forget that you belong here. Number two, don't forget honor is our default posture. Don't forget honor is our default posture. Um, can I just say one of the things that Facebook has really made evident about all of our internal worlds is that criticism is often our default posture. And whenever God starts to move, it's amazing how many expert theologians pop up around the room. As if all of us have PhDs in systematic theology and the history of revival and the expression and manifestation of God's spirit. That we sit back and we judge what God's doing. To the point that we don't even, eh, there's something about it, especially when it's young people. I don't like the way that they're communicating that or, well, you know, that's just part of the gospel. If they knew the whole gospel... If they knew all of it, I mean, that's just, it's just unbalanced. So we sit ourselves in the place of scoffing at what looks incomplete or unbalanced when it's obviously God doing something. I don't know how many teenagers you've been around, but if, 
if the teenagers you've been around love to stay for hours in worship services, please introduce me to them. Because when that starts happening, that is a sign that God is moving. That's a sign that something is happening in the appetites and the desires of a young person when they would rather stand and hear, hear songs sung to God in praise and pray. I mean, let's be honest. Sometimes us adults just being in the place of prayer is work. When you see someone who doesn't have to be there all of a sudden desiring that uh, above other things or like I'm sitting at the youth group waiting and it's like, well, it's 9.30 and they're still there. Like, don't they know I got to be at work tomorrow morning? That's supernatural. And our default posture should be honored towards what God is doing. We see this in David and McCall. Oh, goodness, I wish I could preach on this. 2 Samuel chapter 6. David is ushering the presence of God into Jerusalem, and he's dancing like a madman. He's danced off much of his clothing, and his wife is standing in the palace viewing what's happening through the window. I wish I had time to read it to you, but I don't. She's, she's reviewing, and, and this, is, this is what Scripture says, 2 Samuel chapter 6, if you want to read it that she looks on David's extravagant praise with contempt. She is judging his response to what God's doing in his life. And then what happens to her is for the rest of her days, she becomes fruitless in her womb. And God's judgment is a different message. But that's, that's what 2 Samuel chapter 6 tells us. And this is what I realize about that. Your personal fruitfulness is connected to your heart of corporate honor. Your personal fruitfulness in God is connected to the way you honor what he does corporately. The things you don't understand, the things that don't make sense to you. I'm not saying we never address error, Okay. I'm not saying that. I'm saying our default posture is a posture of honor. That's my default posture. That, that's where I start. I don't start with going, well, Asbury, look at Asbury Revival. All those kids, they, they're not even old enough to know Jesus. And look, they think revival's broken. I mean, I don't know the things we say. You just look at the Facebook arguments. What, what, is, your, what is your default? What's, what's the default posture? Should always be honor. And then God will correct what needs to be corrected. I love, I love, th this is... This guy is, is not even a Christian. He's a rabbi. Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. You know this, the, the revival's breaking out in the early church. The rabbis are really upset about what's going on. And then he, with the voice of wisdom, this is what he says. If the, he tells the other rabbis this. If this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow it. You might even be found opposing God. Don't you love that approach? Careful what you say about this. If it's not of God, it's not going to last anyway. And we've seen that. Things come and go in God's kingdom. But if it is God, be careful, because, be careful, Michael, because you may be having contempt against that which God is doing. So what's the first thing I don't want you to forget? I don't want you to forget that you belong here in this place. You belong a part of what God's doing in our community. The second thing is, I don't want you to forget that honor is our default posture. Number three, don't forget what really matters. Is this too simple? Is this okay? Don't forget what really matters. I love in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 of his followers, two by two, to visit the cities that he plans to visit. Um, Jesus had some strategic thinking involved. So he's sending out groups two by two. They're ministering in the cities that he's, that he's planning to go. And then he gives them specific instructions. Here's how you're going to minister. You're not going to take a bag. You're going to sleep at a door that's open to you. And then he says, here's how you're actually going to respond based on the way people receive you. And then they come back and they are celebrating. And this is what they celebrate. This sounds so like me. After a conference, they're like, Jesus, we prayed and demons left. 
And you know what you know Jesus' response? He did not throw a celebration for their ability to, to exercise demons. This is what he says. Look at this, Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Do not rejoice in this. Do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. There's some perspective. I love what God's doing, Ram Church. Absolutely. And I'm not trying to take it down a few notches, okay? This is not like tall poppy syndrome where I'm like, well, look at God's way over here. Well, you can't be seen. You think too highly of yourself. It's none of that. This is us recognizing God is moving, but I'm going to remember the most valuable thing about all this is that I'm remembered in heaven. Not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus did. There is this simple celebration of, God, there's nothing that I have or that you're doing or that I'm holding or that I've ever seen you do that's a result of my goodness. I remember that when there was no way for my name to be written in an eternal heavenly place, you picked up the pen and saw fit to put the letters of my name in heaven. And I will never get over that. I will never get over that. Don't forget, Ramp Church, what really matters. Paul sums this up in 1 Corinthians. I, I love the book of Corinthians. There's so many issues. It's so real. There's so many issues like happening in the church in Corinth. Paul's addressing people by name. He's talking about like people who are living with other people. I mean, it is, he's like very explicit, too explicit, okay? It's not a rated PG book. And he, and, but then in, in 1 Corinthians 12... Paul is talking about all the amazing gifts that, the, that he's just like going. He's saying basically every gift that God has available, spiritual gift, you guys are operating in it. Prophecy, healing, foretelling the future, gifts of wisdom, working of miracles. It's like it's, it's everywhere. And then at the end of it, the end of that long list, he says, but let me show you a more excellent way. The last verse of 1 Corinthians 12. And do you know then what he goes into? 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. He spends a whole chapter talking about love. And then he says this in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. What is he doing? He's returning them to what matters most. And I never want us to forget, Ramp Church, that while God's moving, we're seeing extraordinary supernatural things. Let's remember that the place of love and being centered in God's love for us and God's love for others, that's what makes all this tick and work in the first place. I, I, I remember when Josh and I were, when we were at Asbury, one of my favorite statements that they said from the pulpit was, was revival is not the same as going viral. And I love that. And not only do we get those wrongs, but sometimes we think, well, if I'm, once we go viral, we think the going viral is actually what we're after. We're not after that. <laughs> it doesn't matter if we go viral or not. Does that make sense? You see how we swap those things? Well, God's blessing is on them. Look how famous they are. Isn't God's blessing what is happening in them and through them and what's happening in eternity for his sake? Isn't that the blessing part? I mean, I don't, I don't think the blessing is the fame or the finances or the, I mean, that's not the, I mean, yeah, take it or leave it, right? Here today, gone tomorrow. People are fickle. All of us in the crowd, we're fickle. I'll like it today and tomorrow I'll put a thumbs down, right? I mean, that, but what's, what God's doing in them what God's doing through them, the way that their appetites are changed, the way that, they're, that, that chains are being broken off of their mind and their hearts, the way they're having purpose in their everyday life, the way that they're recognizing God is at work among us, the way that yesterday I had no desire for him and today I do. That's a miracle from on high. And we celebrate God in our midst. Don't forget what really matters. Number four, don't forget that we're part of the global body of Christ. I love this, another Corinthians verse, because God was moving in incredible ways in the Corinthian church. This is what Paul says to open up th this, this first letter. 
Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus. He's talking to that church, which was a, a collection of house churches. Called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. What is Paul doing? He's showing that whatever God does is doing locally, don't forget, he's doing stuff all over the world. That God is moving in every place around the world. And actually, the fastest growing churches in the world are in the Middle East. And we are looking to them for leadership. They are leading the way in what it looks like to steward what God's doing in, the, in, in, in advancing in the world. And we can never lose sight that we're part of something bigger than us. I love this journey. If you want to study this, Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. There are various outpourings of, of God's spirit. Each one is to a new people group. First one's to Jerusalem. The second one's to the Samarians who had a relationship with the Jewish people, but it was kind of complicated. The next one to, it was to Cornelius. That was, they were Gentiles, but God-fearing Gentiles. And then Acts 19 was the Ephesians, which were full-on Gentile pagans. And you see God using, first outpouring in the people they expected him to, to pour his spirit out on. Oh, they were Jews. The next were people who were kind of Jews, kind of not. We have a checkered past, but... The next one are people who aren't Jews. They're Gentiles, but they still respect Jewish people. The third one were just full-on pagans. And the people in the middle of that would have believed, yeah, we, we get that God's pouring out his spirit on us. That makes sense to us. It is surprising because he used to use one prophet. Now Joel 2 says he's pouring out his spirit on all flesh. So now as a community, we're stepping into the movement of God. But something that's happening, we, we didn't see coming the Sumerians. That, like, that was new. But maybe I can stretch my faith because Philip is a Sumerian and there's something happening there. So I can stretch my faith. Cornelius, that's way off our map. Because God's spirit doesn't pour out in people like that. The Ephesians, God certainly pagan idol worshipers. God would never fill them with, with the most valuable substance in the entire universe. The essence of his nature and spirit. God would never do that, surely not. And something had to happen in their hearts towards the outpouring of the Holy Spirit where their heart was expanded to see God's family in a way that they had never seen before. Hello, diversity. It goes way beyond just skin color. There's something far beyond that to where our hearts are open to realize God actually wants to unify us with people we've never met. Way out all over the global church. Don't forget that we're part of a global body of Christ. Number five, don't forget that you, your, and my, our primary role in all of this is to be a living example. Something starts to happen when, when God's pouring out his spirit. We start to like reflect on, well, I want to do this. Or why is Joe speaking so much? You know, can't I, can I preach? God's given me a word. Or we start to go, why are they leading worship? Or what, you know, we, we start to think in, in ways like we're comparing roles. And just don't, just don't forget that the most important thing about you and me is that we're just living examples of what God's done in our life. Anything else we do is just an add-on. But the most important thing about you and me is that this is our primary role, is that we're living examples. Philippians 3, 12 through 17. This is what Paul says. Not that I've already obtained all this. He's talking about full maturity in Christ. Or I've already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He's been apprehended by heaven. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, I forget what's behind. I strain towards what's ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. All of us then who are mature should take this same view of things. All of us. And if on some point you think differently... That too, God will make clear to you. In other words, this is what he's saying. This message is right, and if you, if you disagree, God's going to show you that you're wrong. <laughs> he has confidence in his message. Verse 16, only let us live up to what we've already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. 
And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. You know what this generation, the younger generations need more than anything? It's not another sermon. They need living sermons. Living examples all around them. That, that the message that they hear preached regularly, they see lived out right in front of them. It's not about perfection. They, they, my kids are more familiar with my weaknesses than I am. But they also, they also see how I respond to my weaknesses. And when I ask for their forgiveness. And when I seek accountability and counsel to my own issues. Does that make sense? They, they, they see me doing those things. So they see me treat my weaknesses in a way that hopefully can be an example to them. That's, that, that's, that's what we need. That is our primary role in this ramp church. It's not to preach something we're not living. It is to live this in a way that it becomes it, it becomes impossible for these next generations to, to, to misunderstand what we're saying because they see it. Number six, final point. Don't forget that there's always more to God than what we've seen or experienced. You know, most, most of the time, the, I can't really go into the history of this and but there, some of our denominational differences are, are um, unavoidable, okay? So I'm not necessarily of the mindset that, well, all of that is bad. I think there's just a, there's just a nature. God's given freedom for, for certain beliefs. I don't really want to talk about that right now. But sometimes we stop and create dividing walls based on the revelation we're choosing not to grow past. In other words, I'm saying in my own revelation of who God is, this is, this is the truth and I will go no further. Aren't you glad the Apostle John didn't do that? Because the Apostle John regularly misidentified Jesus. He didn't know who he was. So he's a teenager. Jesus finds him. He's hanging out with this Jesus dude. And over time, we know that Peter was the first to realize who Jesus was. Jesus celebrates, uh, Jesus celebrates Peter's revelation. But John then is in this group of people who are starting to, to realize Jesus is like God and a human. This is pretty mind-blowing. We didn't have like a category for that. And they're starting to realize this. And John forms a personal relationship with Jesus. This is not just like preacher, like you're a teacher, personal relationship. We know that because at the Last Supper, John is the dude who's, who's like literally chilling on Jesus. Like, like they're eating and he is laying on Jesus. This is, a, this, is, this is a close relationship that they have as friends. Jesus then dies, is resurrected, and then... In a moment of him revealing himself, he comes to the beach and John and Peter are fishing. And Jesus is on the beach cooking fish for them. That's a whole message, but anyway. He's cooking fish for them. Don't you just love that Jesus was cooking? So he's cooking fish for them and Peter and John are trying to figure out who it is. What do you mean? A few days earlier, you were laying on his chest. How come you don't know who this is? Because something happened to him in death, burial, and resurrection that transformed him in a way that, that John had to take a second look. But he realizes and he tells Peter, that is the Lord. And Peter hops out, of the, hops out of the boat, swims to the shore. They have some fish with Jesus. He says, uh, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You know the whole story, right? Yeah. Then we see, though, uh, 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 John, of course, in this inter intermittent time, he moves to Ephesus. Church tradition tells us he's part of the church leadership there. He writes different letters to the church, first, second, and third John. And then he gets this crazy book called Revelation. John is on an island called Patmos. He's been exiled there for his faith. He's been boiled in oil. And left to die. And in that place, in that place of longing, in that wilderness place, he is praying to the Jesus whose chest he laid on. And in that place, Jesus reveals himself to John. And this is the man who John knew intimately. 
And the appearance of Jesus, Jesus revealed himself physically. The appearance of Jesus was so overwhelming to John that John fell at Jesus' feet as dead. Do you realize your future revelation of God can be so profound compared to your current revelation of God? That what now you can treat flippantly, you will fall at, you will fall on your face as a dead person. John knew him intimately, but you know what? There was still more of him to know. Do you know what our posture should be when God is pouring out His Spirit? When we say more, that's not spoiled, entitled question that is God I realize that whatever it looks like on earth this is like a thimble in an ocean of the reality of who you are for me not to ask for more would be an insult to your character and your nature we want to see you like John saw you on Patmos where the you I've seen it, it doesn't even look like you anymore. It seems, it seems so small compared to who you are, yet I know there's even more than what I'm experiencing now. Anybody hunger for the, hungry for the more of God? Ben, would you come up? We're just going to pray. This is the thing about what God's made available to you and me. It just comes by faith. Just faith. Say faith. faith. You don't have to do some crazy incantation. We're not going to teach you a spell when you leave here or give you a wand. You don't have to contort or cut your body or any other crazy things. It just comes by faith. Hebrews 11 says that Abraham left the place where he was when God called him to the land that he was called to be by faith. And then it says this, and then he lived there by faith. He lived in a tent. He was dreaming of a city, but he lived in that place by faith. And I want to tell you, we're so fascinated with the new, but I want to tell you this. The same thing that got you here will get you there. And it's called faith. What gets you a revelation, a book of revelation experience when you're John living in the resurrection or when you're John living at the Last Supper? It's just that same childlike wonder. Do you remember being amazed by God? Do you remember that? You remember when you were a kid and you just couldn't fathom how like, what is, like how can he be like everywhere? Like, where does God end? I can't even think about that. It breaks my brain. <laughs> That's called wonder. I want us to be a people. I want us to be a community that the things of God never become common to us. Never. We're not professional churchgoers, professional ch sermon listen toers, professional home group goers. You know, like that is not it. Like we're just here seeking after God together. So I'm going to leave some space now. Would you just stand on your feet all around this room? And we're going to we're going to dismiss just like this.